Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called Timelines. Timelines. The big idea of this series is waiting on God to act or trusting his promises can be challenging. Sometimes we feel we need to help God out. We need to move things along a little bit faster. But when we take God's plan into our own hands, many times it doesn't work out so well. So what do we do when God doesn't move on our timeline? And the verse that I want to give you that is the verse of this series is Habakkuk 2.3. And it says this, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. An appointed time. This is the Greek word there, keros. It, it, it means that there is a, a, a time, an appointed time, a specific time in space, an opportunity. And many people miss great opportunities because they weren't ready for them. Has there ever been like a stock that you're like, man, I should invest in this stock. And you didn't do it. And like five years later, you would have been a millionaire but you didn't do it, and you're like, ah, oh, man, I could have bought Apple, I could have bought Amazon, I could have bought whatever, but you missed an opportunity because you didn't step through that keros window while it was open, that moment of time. There's an appointed time, the Bible says, though it linger, wait for it. And that's like the worst sentence in the world, wait for it. I gotta be honest and transparent, your boy here. If there was a scale of best to worst waiters waiting, I'm the worst. I'm at the bottom of the barrel. I am the worst person to wait for anything. I want things right now. Like when I go on Amazon, if I can't get it with Amazon Prime delivered tomorrow, I'm probably not gonna buy it. Right? I want it now. Like I will literally get up and drive two hours to go get it at the store now instead of wait to have it delivered tomorrow. I'm horrible at waiting. I am. I'm pretty bad at it. But this happened to me last week. I'm flying home, and I get to the airport. I get online, and I never check a bag, because I hate to wait online to check a bag. I always take a carry-on. That's it. Every, if, whatever I can fit in the carry-on is enough for the vacation. But my wife is with me, which means we have 12 suitcases. <laughs> no, we had this one big suitcase, and I had to check it in. And I get to the counter area, and there's nobody there working. A lot like Walmart. All these, right, all these counters, no one working. And so I'm standing there. Five minutes goes by. Seven minutes goes by. There's two minute increments. Nine minutes goes by. Nobody. So now I start to get a little vocal. Not in any rude way. I wasn't being nasty, but I'm impatient. I'm like, hey, anybody work here? The boss like, shut up. I swear to God, shut up. And I'm like, hey. And I'm, cause I'm, I'm like tired of waiting. Like, what's up? Like, I'm a customer here. I was like, I can't, I can't take this. I get out of line. I go up to the lady. I said, excuse me, is there anybody working the counter over here? They'll be with you in a few minutes, sir. 45 minutes. Nobody, nobody. At the, I was like, I will never fly this airline again. Right? That's just me. Because I'm impatient. I was, I was upset. I didn't, wasn't nasty, I got up to the counter, did my thing, when they finally showed up 45 minutes later, got checked in, got on a plane, plane takes off. A four and a half hour flight, we're supposed to be in New York, at four and a half hours, they say, oh, ladies and gentlemen, we're to give you this announcement today, that uh, we're being redirected to land in Orlando. Dude, Orlando should have been an hour and a half. We've been circling, we didn't know, nobody knew, we've been circling four and a half hours around Florida. We land in Florida, they're like, there was a rocket that was supposed to go off, so we got redirected, so you got to sit on a plane, and we don't have enough fuel to get back to New York, so we have to refuel. So then we're sitting there waiting to be refueled, and like, oh, our pilots just timed out. So now we got to wait for new pilots. Ten hours I sat on that plane, and my monitor was broke. My TV was broke. I couldn't even watch a movie. That makes it, like, exponentially worse. I can't even numb my brain while waiting. Anybody as impatient as me, like you don't like to wait? I don't like to wait, especially when I'm paying money to be somewhere and to do something. 
I'm bad at waiting. I want to order my food and it be on my table in like 10 minutes. You go to them restaurants and it's an hour between ordering your food and getting it. And I'm like, what's taking so long? In society, we don't like to wait. And there's this guy in the Bible that I want to study. His name's David. David is going about his business, tending his father's sheep. A prophet of the Lord shows up to his house named Samuel, calls him out of the backyard and says, hey, I'm anointing you to be the next king of Israel. Dude's like a teenager. Has no qualifications to be this king. The gap between anointing and appointing was 20 years. 20 years between being told you're going to be king and the day that he sat on the throne of Israel. 20 years. Man, most of us give up after a week. Most of us stop going to the gym after, like, our biceps are sore. And this dude kept honoring and pursuing God for 20 years. It's a little bit like my story. I've been on staff here at this church for 28 years. Not in this magnitude and not in this building. We founded our church in downtown Middletown. But at 14 years old, when I got my working papers, I signed a contract to work for Christian Faith Fellowship Family Church Incorporated. I did not know I was signing my life away. I thought it was a life commitment. It was a death sentence. You know, just, you know, <laughs> just kidding. But my entire life, my dad founded this church in 1982 when I was three years old. And my dad said to me, you know, every time we would do something different or go to the building, my dad said to me, son, one day this will all be yours. And I said, I don't want it. <laughs> one day, son, this will all be yours. I don't want to be a pastor. I want to be a mechanic. Right? I'll go to my dad, like, hey, dad, would you guys still love me if I wasn't a pastor, if I became a motorcycle mechanic? And they're like, we would love you, son. You could do whatever you're going to do, but you're going to be a pastor. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not doing that, right? Like, and I really did everything I could to not be used by God, uh, but I have been on staff. I, I, I went through some rebellious stages in my life and was wayward, but I still came back to work because I wanted that paycheck, right? Your boy ain't stupid. But as I got into my 30s, you know, I felt like I had that carrot dangled in front of me. One day, this is going to be yours. And I'm like 35 years old, and I'm like, hey, Dad, I feel like I'm getting kind of old. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm chasing the train of life, and I'm getting to the train station, and I'm getting ready to get on and, 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 and hit it big and, and get it to that place in my life. And the train has closed its doors, and it's leaving. Like, I feel like I'm missing my time. Anybody felt like that in your life? That you waited a little too long and you feel like you're missing your time, you're missing that peak? And David's sitting back and he was like, I was anointed to be king, but it's still 15 years and I'm still not doing it. Like, when's this going to happen? Let me give you a little bit of background. God is done with Saul. King Saul, he's, God had appointed Saul, had called him, but Saul's just kind of boneheaded. He's not listening to God. He's being disobedient. And God's like, I'm kind of d- I'm done with this guy. So he sends the prophet Samuel to go anoint David to be the next king. And David wasn't ready. He was a boy. He wasn't, he wasn't trained. He wasn't learned. It. He was just a shepherd. One day, there's a keros moment in time. His dad says, son, I need you to go take lunch to your brothers. They're on the battlefield. They're on the front lines. So David said, yes, sir. Takes up the lunch and goes to deliver lunch to his brothers. And look at what happens here in 1 Samuel 17. Uh, Goliath comes out. He challenges the armies of God. And David said to Saul, 1 Samuel 17, 32, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of this man. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, yeah, right. You're not enough. You're not strong enough. You're not big enough. You're not powerful enough. You're not enough. He'll kill you. You'll never do it. And I wonder how many of us in our own minds allow that lie to be told to us that we're not enough. You're not enough for your spouse. You're not enough for your boss. You're not enough for your kids. 
You're not enough for everybody else around. There's just this lie. You're not enough. Saul says to him, you're not able to go against and fight this giant. You are but a youth. You're but a youth. You're not enough. You're not good enough. He's been a man of war since his youth. You're not qualified. And there's this unhealthy comparison, and we do it all the time, guys. We constantly compare ourselves to other people on Instagram and Facebook. This is a person who does what I want to do, but look how great they are. And I'm telling you, Instagram and Facebook are all lies. Nobody ever posts a picture of them fighting with their spouse. Look at us on the beach. <laughs> and you're comparing their highlight reel to your behind the scenes. My life is nothing like that. Look, they're on the beach. How many times they got a vacation in one year? They're so happy. They've got it all. Look at their life. And it's, and it's, I challenged my friends. I was on a trip a few weeks ago. And I challenged them and said, Ew, let's all take pictures of our first service with all the chairs empty. Like, our first services are smaller than our second services. How come we don't do that? How come we all send each other pictures from a perfect angle with all the front seats filled? Like, we're lying to each other. That's not every single one of your services. Like, we do this, and we start comparing unhealthy comparisons, and we feel lesser. I'm not enough. I don't measure up. But watch this. David makes a shift. Watch what David says. But David says back to Saul, the king, mind you. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. That's such a powerful statement. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Bro, you just did an hour ago. <laughs> like you literally just left tending the sheep to come bring them lunch. What he's basically saying is this. I used to be a youth. I used to let people look down on me. I used to let people think I wasn't enough. But today, sir, today I'm a giant killer. Today I'm a giant killer. I used to be who you say I am. But today I'm going to let you know who he says I am. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I used to be. I used to be all the things that you remember me to be, but that's no longer who I am. Come on, somebody. This is the Kairos moment. There's a shift. He's stepping through. I used, that used to be true of me, but today it's not. Come on, somebody. Somebody's been stuck in their past. They've been stuck by their old identity. I used to be the things that you say, Saul. I used to be lesser than my calling. I used to let people look down on me. But today you ain't going to do that, king. You ain't going to do that today, king. I'm not that guy and you're not that guy. You might be the king, but you don't got the power to talk to me like that. Come on, man. This, whoo, yo, I got, I'm revved up myself. <laughs> David says this inside of himself. I've been training for this moment my whole life. Point number one. When you find yourself in a season of waiting, it's time to train. When you find yourself in a season of wait, it's time for training. How, what are you doing to get yourself ready for that moment of time? What are you doing to get yourself ready for the opportunity of a lifetime? One day I'm going to be X, Y, Z. Okay, are you studying to be that? Are you researching to be that? Do you have the tools? What are you doing while you're waiting? While you're waiting, you should be preparing for the next season of your life. Now, I don't like time, I don't like waiting. But waiting gives me time to prepare for battle. Man, listen, you know you, know you don't do as, like, you know you don't accomplish as much in your mind and personally when you're busy. You know you don't. You don't have time to sit down and read a brand new book when you're like overwhelmed with work hours can't do it. This is what David says here. He says, let me tell you a little bit about my preparation. When a lion or a bear 
came into my field to take a lamb from my flock, I went, went after him and struck him and delivered it out of the mouth. Yo, that's hardcore. All right, because I, I would, like, shoot it with a gun from a long distance. But watch this. And if it rose up against me, I would catch it by its beard. Yo, I'm not putting my hand nowhere near that dude's mouth. Right? I would catch it by the beard and strike it and kill it. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And then he gets dirty. He says, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, go for it. Go for it. Go and let the Lord be with you. He says, but, but before you go, I want you to wear my armor. And Saul was like some seven feet tall. David was but a lad. David puts this armor on. And you ever try like wearing your dad's shoes? You're like sliding around in his shoes as a kid or whatever, put on the clothes. David was like, I can't wear this. I can't fight like this. I want to give you another leadership principle. Be very careful trying to act like someone else. Be very careful trying to put on someone else's shoes and someone else's clothes. You need to be you. God created you uniquely brilliant for you to who you are. He has placed you in a family, in a community, in a job that your voice is uniquely resounding to that area. Be used by God as you are. But one day when I get somewhere, no, 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 no. Right now. Yeah, but if, as soon as I work out a few things in my life, then. Then what? We're all flawed. We're all jaded. We're all messed up. God wants to use those parts. God's really great about using broken pieces and making masterpieces. So at first, Saul's okay with David's victory because David would come back and still dance and sing for Saul and it would calm his heart. But after David kills this giant, a new song comes out. And this song doesn't calm the heart of Saul. It infuriates his soul. And this song is this. Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his ten thousands. Oh, how the comparison has changed. Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his ten thousands. David's ten times better than Saul. This begins to infuriate Saul. And Saul at first can, can kind of keep his anger hidden. There's like this moment that it's exposed for a second. David does something. Saul gets upset, grabs a spear, throws it at him. David does, whoa, out of the matrix, zoom. And something amazing happens. David doesn't grab that spear out of the wall and throw it back. Mm. A lot of us, a lot of us can't help but throw spears back. And though you may not be throwing actual spears, but your mouth is a sword. Someone says something you don't like, you've got to throw it right back. Someone says something that hurts you because you've got to throw it right back. There's a great book. Great, great book. I read it every single year. It's very little. You can read it about three hours or less. It's called The Tale of Three Kings. The Tale of Three Kings. It's a play about this exact kind of story, the transition of David into the king and the journey and his response to Saul. Because I always thought that I was a David. I thought, I mean, I was pure at heart. I'm just doing what God's called me to do. Everyone's attacking me. Saul's coming after me. But listen, the moment you take the spear out of the wall and throw it back, you become Saul. The moment you have to defend yourself, the moment you have to say it back, well, if they weren't nasty to me, I wouldn't be, you are Saul. And that's what's in your heart. You are in control of that. 
It's a great book, Tale of Three Kings, got to read it. But then, ultimately, Saul can no longer keep it private. It becomes public. He orders his son, Jonathan, to kill David in uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And Jonathan appeals his dad, and, and, and David gets a short-term appeal, and, and so he's able to kind of flee. He's like, I got to go. I can't stay in this toxic environment. And I want to give somebody encouragement. Somebody in here, you've been in a toxic job for years because you're afraid of retirement. You're afraid of, well, I've only got 10 more years, and then I've got this great retirement plan. And when you really, like, do the math and look at it, you're talking about, like, $500 a month. A $500 a month difference. Like, get your real estate license, sell one house. You got the money. Like, get a new job. Do one t extra task a month, and you got the extra $500. Like, we, 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 we got this lie of money, and we're, we're like systematized to lies about fear of not having enough when we're older. So we settle for a miserable existence now out of a fear of not being enough tomorrow. You let that set in for a moment. You let that set in for a moment. I, I, listen, I, this is not like financial advice. I'm no financial whatever. But if you just put a little bit of money each week into, into the stock market or into something that's a high interest yield, put a little bit of money into a Roth IRA. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there. You wouldn't have to worry about tomorrow. The Bible tells us not to. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will handle itself. But you need to prepare for it. Need to do, so. all right, anyway. There's another season of weight that we see with David. David has an opportunity to fight back at Saul. But David says inside of himself, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. So you know what a season of weight allows you to do? A season of weight allows you to build your character. A season of weight allows you to build your character. You see, character is built in private, not in public. God keeps David hidden for a season to develop him. Character, who you really are, is the person that you are when no one else is around. The thoughts that go through your mind, the actions that you do, when no one else is around, that's your character. That's who you are. Are you motivated enough to get up and take yourself to the gym without someone else motivating you? Right? That's part of your makeup. It's part of your character. And God's keeping David hidden for a season. He's like, David, I want to use you. You're going to be a mighty man, but there's a few things I need to work on. And there's a lot of you today. You're like, I'm waiting for my moment. I'm waiting for my limelight. But I'm just, I'm wondering maybe you're not ready. Maybe the limelight, maybe the spotlight is the actual thing that's going to destroy you because you're not ready for it yet. So maybe God's keeping you hidden long enough to prepare you for your Kairos moment. One might look and say, well, David fled. He was not in faith. And I'm looking at it as the opposite. David flees. He goes to a cave. And it is in a cave that he builds his army. Is it in a, it's in a cave that he builds his character. It's in a cave, not a palace, not a stage, not a ballroom, a cave that men begin to seek him out. David's mighty men of valor begin to seek him out. Not because he arrived, but because he was hidden. Come on, somebody. Well, when I get there, then everybody will follow me. When I get there, no, 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 no. True leadership does it when no one's looking. Leaders aren't made on stages. Leaders are made in boardrooms, sitting down, writing notes and writing strategy and taking plans and saying, man, if I could push other people forward. If I could make someone else great. That's what David was doing. David had opportunity, many, many opportunities to kill Saul. And he said, I will not touch God's anointed. It was in quiet places. 
And the last point I want to make today is this, that we must prepare for moments of momentum. And here's what we don't get about leadership, and here's what we don't get about our lives, is that it is the downward trajectory that gives you the moment for the next peak in your life. Oh, this is so, it's so anti what we think, guys. If I could just get to the top, then what? Then what? Anybody, everybody, ever been on a roller coaster? I've been on like two. That's why I don't go on them. I'm scared of tar. Those things that scare me so bad, roller coasters. They do. Like, I don't, ugh. I'm a little bit of a control freak. So if I can drive it, fly it, whatever, cruise it, I'm on. But someone else in control? Nah, I'm good. I'm not going on a roller coaster. But here's what I think I know about roller coasters. You get on that thing, and it starts out. And it goes like straight up, tick, 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 tick. That's the most anxious, provoking thing ever, just that noise. Tack, 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 tack. And the only thing worse than that, tack, 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 is when it stops doing tack, 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 tack. Because now you know it's about to happen. It's about to unleash. Your stomach about to come out, your throat flying to outer space. And all of a sudden, wow! You lose your dang mind, that thing's going straight down. And it is in the downward trajectory that it builds enough momentum to do those loop-de-loops and twists and turns. And It's in the downward. It's not going up. It's not when the upward climb that builds it. It's when it's coming down. And many of us give up in the downward. Many of us give up when things are coming down. And I'm not where I used to be. That's a season of weight. It's a season of momentum. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But that's a low place. You're preparing me in the low place for the next peak of my life. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You've been giving up. You've been giving up in the low seasons. You've been giving up in the dry seasons. It's in the dry seasons that God wants to hydrate you with his anointing. We've got to change our perspective. We've got to change our eyes. For the investor, a bear market is where millionaires are made. If that resounds with someone trying to hit somebody's ears today, the bear market is where millionaires are made. When the housing bubble pops, Right? Housing bubble pops. Everyone's scrambling. They're so scared. Oh, my God, my house isn't worth what it is, what it was anymore. Let's go buy some. You get what I'm saying? But you got to be ready for that. So you store up. You get prepared during those seasons when everyone else is getting afraid. That's when we're going to invest. That's faith. That's faith. That's what God's leading us in doing. That's what this guy, David, everyone else is afraid. David says, Now's the time. I'm going to step up now. Everyone else is fleeing. Everyone else is running. I'm going to kill a giant today. He steps in to that moment of time. Say, but Pastor Mike, that's great for him, but I've been waiting for my blessing for a long time. 20 years? 20 years? I mean, he waited 20 years. But in between, in between those 20 years, God did some of the most amazing things in this guy's life. While still waiting, he didn't just kill one giant. He leveled the whole family in his weight. He was still busy in his weight. He wasn't where he was going to be, but he wasn't stuck where he used to be. He was still busy about his calling during the wait. Some of you just allowed the enemy to get you stuck, make you stop making progress in your life. I'm not saying go out and get ahead of God. I'm saying do exactly what God's called you to do. Well, God's not doing it. He's not moving. Maybe God's not saying no to you. Maybe he's just saying not yet. There's some things I still need to do in your life. There's some areas I still need to work on. You're not ready to get to where I need you to be. Yet, you will be. But this is a lifetime. 
This is a lifetime. Christianity is your lifetime. Christianity is eternity. It's going to take some time to get us in line with where God's taking us. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time in your word. I pray, God, that this word will not return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our guide, for giving us wisdom, for leading us, guiding us, and directing us into all truth. Lord, I bless everyone the sound of my voice today. They are the head and not the tail above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.